Hi all together. Hi to the audience. Good afternoon. This is uh, Milan Uri. I'm Terahertz sales engineer at Mendel Systems. I have some backgrounds in physics. I did my PhD in the field of photoacoustic imaging and tomography and signal processing. I'm with Mendel since around two and a half years now. Next to me there's Enrico Dardanis. He has also some roots in physics and in specific terahertz near field spectroscopy. He is at uh, Menlo since two and a half years now and he will be the responsible today to give you some examples on what to do with terahertz waves and, and specific on some terahertz applications that you in the end are going to decide which one are the most exciting for you. The uh, presentation today will start with a short introduction on Menlo systems of course that you know this company a little better that you know what our, our main expertises and in specific the seminar will take place on the uh, topic of terahertz time domain broadband spectroscopy where we will go here to show you some technical information in the beginning give you a fundamental understanding on how to produce and how to detect terahertz waves and of course in the end you will be excited i guess to see a system live running and doing some test measurements in the end the last quarter of this uh, one hour today is dedicated to you so please whenever you have any questions you can collect them already in the Q&A where you can put your questions and we will be pleased to answer this whether it's going to be in this presentation right away or in the end where we reserve you this 15 minutes. I'll start by my presentation by mentioning a few words on Mendel Systems. Our company is based in the very southwest of Munich as you can maybe see from the background of our screen. This is the famous Frauenkirche in the center of Munich and under good weather conditions you can see the Opsum here. So it's a beautiful location here. It was founded 2001 as a spin-off of the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics. Two of the uh, company leaders did the PhD under the later awarded Professor Theodor Hensch who has been Nobel Prize awarded by the invention of the frequency comms. Under this development uh, frequency comms have been um, developed using fiber um, technology lasers, which is one of our core components. If you follow this first line here, the three main core components that Menlo Systems is offering is frequency comms, femtosecond fiber lasers that are part of frequency comms and also part of terahertz time domain spectroscopy systems, which is the main topic today. Apart from that, Menlo Systems uh, holds around 130 uh, employees right now, out of which a good third holds a PhD degree. Most of them are from the field of engineering and physics. Mano Systems also owns a worldwide network of distributors and partners, to mention just two very famous ones among them. It's Torlabs, one of our co-founders and our strategic partner who recently joined the company Hamamatsu Japan. So all in all, we can look back to a continued growth over 20 years almost 20 years now and this is also can also be followed by our continuously um, adding added value to our product portfolio which ranges from frame to second fiber lasers frequency comms terahertz spectrometers but also timing system not only dedicated for the scientific community but also for the industrial market so as you see on this slide here our three main uh, components are shown here from left to right. We have the femtosecond fiber lasers, a core component of most of the systems to the right, the terahertz systems and the frequency comms. You might wonder where you use fiber second and in specific femtosecond fiber lasers. To mention a few markets, you see it on the left figure. It's the biophotonics. It's of course the terahertz uh, spectroscopy region, but it's also metrology reasons, test, test measurements, and also material processing and 3D printing in specific. Our customers, as I said, are from each part of the university, research industries, but also really national laboratories and industry markets. Now, this is the time where I'm supposed to show you a live demo of a system, and this I can do because the system is so small. So basically, as you will know later, this is one of the core component by which you can also generate and detect terahertz waves, one of the fundamental sources you would need. I can plug this oscillator. So basically you must imagine this is a laser source. Some know them from the labs. Some are a little bigger like Titan Sapphire lasers. Well, this one is a 15, 16 nanometer based laser source. We call this laser source erbium based laser sources. And it gives you sh short pulses in around uh, 
60 to 100 femtoseconds. So all this fiber inside this laser head here, and what is nice about this laser head, it's so, it's so compact, it's all fiber, and the fibers are even glued inside. There are no movable parts or no saturable absorbers as you would see it from um, other suppliers, which, is, which, which makes the system so robust. So I can plug this battery solar station to the laser source, and each laser from us comes with a certain LED light that shows the mode locking status of such a laser system. Mode locking status is a fundamental uh, condition which enables the laser to be in operation. So don't worry, it's not the laser output, but it will be the LED that flags off here. And if I turn on this battery station, it flags from reddish, bluish to something in a green regular heartbeat. And once this is achieved, the laser is ready for operation. Even if I knock on a laser, it keeps the mode locked, which is shown by the green light. So to show you this, I have to mention that this laser source is one of the core components of most of our uh, systems that we provide. Similar laser systems, similar technology are also being used for our core component, which is the frequency comb. You might wonder what may a frequency comb be good for? A frequency comb can be on a high level, very easily explained as a ruler to measure laser frequencies up to a very precise digit, which is not available by a simple electronic means. In specific, applications include optical clocks or airborne gas monitoring, where our lasers are being uh, operated in a controlled manner. To give you just some a few numbers, we are, what, what precision we are talking about. We, it, we can achieve a precision or a, a accuracy of the system to define a laser, um, laser frequency up to the 18th digit of the comma in just 120 seconds. And the stability to define this precision is, is given as five times 10 to the minus 18 in just one second. To compare these scales, so this is equivalent to an error of less than one second since the Big Bang. So this is really a tremendous result. Okay, now let's come to the main topic today. Uh, we are talking about terahertz. Terahertz is an uh, energy gap that is so far not addressed so easily. You well know the electronics and the photonic side. There are different ways of how to achieve and how to address the terahertz band gap, which is around one to say 10 terahertz in the, in the normal definition. There are many applications that you are well familiar with, either from microphone or microwaves or from the infrared, you know the visible part, the ultraviolet or X-rays in the higher frequency range. Let us have a look on the application, what terahertz can be helpful to. You see some examples given here. Let me say these are not all the examples, but one of the more sophisticated and one of the most frequently used. So we have the pharmacy on one side, something like a, a monitor processing where you can by spectroscopic footprints differentiate between different tablets and do the controlled steps by terahertz. We have the safety side to differentiate different liquids, for instance, for a security check on airports. We have the non-destructive testing field as also referred to as NDT, for instance, on the painting layer control of cars. And we have material sciences, one of the main application fields, and of course the optics not to mention also the biosensing part. So Enrico will type in in a few seconds some of the applications that you are freely uh, able to choose between. In the end, we will prepare, depending on the time left, around three applications. So please um, look at the chat window and uh, in between we will have some time to set up this information where you are freely free to choose. Let's have a look on how to generate and detect terahertz waves, the classical ways. So there's different ways on how to address the terahertz gap, as I said, coming from the higher frequency part or coming from the lower frequency part. The first slide shows the, the, the first case coming from the photonics or the optics side. Here you could either use a femtosecond fiber or a femtosecond laser, ultra short pulse laser, or an optical bead by two continuous wave uh, laser sources. There are different ways on how to generate terahertz. You can use either a crystal where, which will be excited by the optical pulse and by optical rectification, you are creating electron wave, uh, terahertz waves. Or nowadays, most likely and the most flexible way on how to do this is to use photoconductive switches or so semiconductor antennas. In the first case, using short pulses, broadband pulses, you will get a broadband terahertz spectrum. This is one of the main differences 
between the broadband terahertz or also called time domain spectroscopy or CW terahertz spectroscopy. I not go into much detail for this part, but our part will be will concentrate on the upper part here. But on a side note, let me add the second option to come from the lower uh, frequency end part from the electronics part. And this you can do by using microwaves and applying a diode, which enables you again to get continuous wave terahertz waves. This talk will be about this first part using a femtosecond pulse, using photoconductor switches and operating it into high broadband turret spectroscopy. Let's have a more closer look on how we create uh, terahertz waves at Mano systems. And in specific, some of the parts you will see for all applications and all cases, how to then generate and detect terahertz. But one of the most important features here is on the first hand, the ultra fast laser. So this is the laser source I had in the hand before. Typically such a fiber laser comes fiber coupled with two output ports. One is going to the emission site, a second one is going to the detection. Now, if you want to sample a terahertz signal at different timestamps, because the technology itself is a time resolved measurement, you would use for one branch a certain time delay. There are different ways on how to address such a time delay. A very conventional and most precise way as of to date is to use an optical delay line. And this is what's shown here. So basically this is a linear motor stage where you would have certain reflectors on the back end and it moves back and forth. While I was saying that the full system, systems that we from Mendel Systems offer are fiber coupled, let me add this on a side note, this is the only tiny space where there's a free space application of the full system. So if this linear stage moves back and forth, you can imagine these optical pulses if both fibers have the same lengths, they sample the terahertz signal at slightly different timestamps. Now let's let us have a look on the third very important component. It's the emitter or the detector site. This is the semiconductor material I was mentioning. Enrico, you might in between start offering the different applications and I continue with my talk right away. So on the right side on this figure, you see the scheme how to, how to generate and detect terahertz waves. First of all, we use semiconductor materials. An incoming optical pulse that's shown uh, in a reddish color hits the semiconductor material in a very defined and precise mode. This, uh, this uh, excites electron and hole pairs. So we are creating electron and hole pairs. In addition to that, we apply a certain bias voltage to the semiconductor material. In turn, the bias voltage accelerates the electron through pairs, which enables to produce terahertz waves. This is all, all on a controlled optical excitation. Now, since we created terahertz waves, we have to deal with it. And we, here at Manlo, we are using either polymer lenses or parabolic mirrors, depending on the configuration and the needs of your experiment. So what you see in the um, yellow color over there is the terahertz path. We are using polymer lenses, less, less sensitive than classical optics as you know it but we use them for collimation and focusing of the terahertz path, for instance. So this in the center, I have to use my, let's see, the pointer. So this is the center where we typically place the sample. In this case, it shows a pinhole. A pinhole is being used to do the fine alignment of the terahertz path, path in the end. Of course, you are free to adjust all these spaces in here. So this depends really on your experiment. You could use different focal lengths and different settings. You can even go into reflection. So this just is just showing the transmission path here. Now on the detection side, we use actually the same principle as for terahertz generation. Now here, the incoming terahertz wave is replacing the bias voltage because it accelerates the electron through the holes. Again, we are creating those electrons and hole pairs by optical excitation. Now, what you measure here is the photocurrent. You amplify the photocurrent measured, no need for lock-in amplification, signal to noise ratio of focal conductive antennas is much higher than you would, than you, than you know it from earlier days maybe. And then of course we AD convert it and compute it in the PC. Let me go to the next slide, Enrico. So this scheme shows the sampling scheme again. We have the femtosecond laser source. We have two pulses outcoming, whether it's fiber coupled or not. We have a delay stage over here. If I 
if I move it back and forth, I can sample different stems of the time resolved measurement of the terahertz signal itself. Now by Fourier transform, by Fourier transform, we can analyze the spectroscopic footprint of such a system. Again, I have to explain the, nat the nature of such a system is to give you a time resolved signal. So this will, you will get per hardware and per definition. By computational means, you can get the spectrum of uh, your analyzed data. And here's a typical example which you can use, which has shown some nice footprints, which, will, which we will also show you later on. You typically measure a reference signal, then you compare it to the sample. So you're just replacing plain air by your sample. You see a certain uh, decline in the, uh, in the amplitude, and you might also observe certain phase shifts due to changes in the refractive index of the material. And this is the clue of the, of the terahertz time domain spectroscopy system. You could use this either to look at the spectroscopic footprints as given here compared to a reference, or you could use it to measure thicknesses of a sample in the time domain, which you will observe by certain changes in the time domain, or you can use it to analyze a sample by calculating the refractive index of your material. So this is what's shown below. We have the absorption shown here and the refractive index here, which can be derived from a single measurement from a more or less single shot from such a laser sort, which, which creates broadband terahertz spectroscopic data. Now, dealing with uh, time domain spectroscopy, there are different ways which address different regions of the applications. And here at Menlo, ours include three tif different systems. One's more dedicate, dedicated to OEM customers, uh, customers or students who work with the system don't need to have much access to it, or plain terahertz time domain spectroscopy applications. From left to right, we have the TerraSmart over here. That's the compact one. This system includes such a laser system, a PC. Everything is integrated nicely into a 19 inch rack box. And you have, of course, the terahertz path that gives you certain flexibility, of course, because the fibers can be delayed in a, in a length that you desire. In the middle, we have the Terra K15. I call this the multi-talent at Manual System because it adds a certain value in terms of the optical part of the system. As you know, we use a femtosecond fiber laser for creating electron uh, for terahertz generation detection, but you could use the same laser for optical excitation of your material. And this is what Terra K15 stands for. And then in contrast to the first two ones, which are using the optical delay line, as I explained to you earlier, we have a third model. As you can see it from this picture here, it uses two lasers. Two lasers that are, however, locked to each other, but with a well-defined manner in the repetition, well-defined difference in the repetition rate. So it's one characteristic of such a laser system is the repetition rate, how often you fire a pulse in a certain time interval. If you control these uh, repetition rate differences nicely, it adds up until a second pulse hits the first pulse again. This means uh, you can use a much faster scan rates and achieve a much higher spectral resolution because there's an <clears throat> inverse relation between the length of your scan path and the tiniest spectral resolution you can get out of your system. Let's have a look on the first system again. As I said, the compact laser source is inside this laser system. It's a turnkey system. So it comes with software, all the hardware and uh, electronics that you would need to do terahertz spectroscopy. There are two values that I'd like to share with you. One is the dynamic range. This is one of the key parameters. Basically, it's nothing else than the signal to noise ratio. And on the other hand, it's the bandwidth of such a system. So how many terahertz can I measure? In contrast to the first system, we have a different fiber laser source here. A fiber laser source that's much more for sophisticated, which offers you to do optical palm terahertz probe experiment, which can be even synchronized to synchrotrons uh, outside of the terahertz spectrometer, which uh, to keep it short, give you much more flexibility for such a system. Looking on the terahertz pulse, we introduced a new terahertz pulse, not using polymer lenses anymore because simply the detector, uh, the emitter, terahertz emitter, delivers much higher bandwidth. A higher bandwidth that, on the other hand, uh, yields a certain attenuation by polymer lenses. So we replaced the polymer lenses for this specific emitter by parabolic mirrors. And here you see use, the use of four off-axis parabolic mirrors, two for focusing, you have the plug-in detector, plug-in emitter on that side. You have the collimated part and again, the focus part where you place a sample. In our case, here we have a placeholder pinhole for fine alignment. 
The software looks similar to this shown here. So basically, as I said, it's a time resolved measurement. So this you get for free from the system. It's a time domain signal. What parameters to define this here is the amplitude and uh, how many echoes you see after such a pulse, how, how nicely a pulse is shaped. You can transfer from time domain into Fourier domain by um, Fourier transformation. And what you then observe is this spectrum, spectroscopic information of a sample here. The value that's given here just shows a reference measurement. You might be wondering why these uh, declines or these peaks are coming from. This is basically water absorption. So if you're not familiar with terahertz yet, let me say that water is a strong absorber of terahertz. You can of course get rid of these um, peaks over here by purging your experiment. But for some experiment, it might be required to know how exact your system is. Our systems all can be remotely addressed and uh, you can use it basically with every modern programming language. What is nice about uh, newer development is that you cannot oper operate only one emitter and one detector, but also several detectors, several emitters to make the best out of your system and to give you the mo most um, flexibility for your experiment. An example is shown here. You have one emitter, one sample, which is placed between emitter one and detector one, which gives you the transmitted signal on the one hand, that's the blue signal. And at the same time, without changing your experiment, you can detect the reflected signal of the same sample and overlay it, of course, in the software in the end. I have to look into the chat room in between, see if you have some questions. Okay, this still refers to the application side. I will come back to it once we start with the application. It should be in the next slides. I skipped this slide for a while. I like to share one information on the Terra ASOPs. So maybe you know this face sitting right next to me, that's Enrico. So he is the one who's also responsible to install or also to produce your ultra fast systems. And as you can see from the left figure again, it's two laser sources slightly locked to each other, but with a well-defined difference in the repetition rate, this difference sums up such that it comes back and samples the same pulse under a certain um, condition. Let me explain you in more detail. We have one laser source here, second laser source here. I call this pump. The second one is probe. So you call this by definition a pump probe experiment. Each uh, of these laser pulses has a slight delay. As you can see it here, the delay sums up and enables you to sample the same terror signal at different timestamps. You can do this by a certain master master um, locking configuration. You have the same reference. Uh, under which you lock laser B and laser A to it and you adjust for slight delays by certain control elements here. I'm not going too much into detail as of this. And of course, if your rec experiment requires uh, imaging purposes as, of, as for non-destructive testing or safety, um, Terra Image is a automated imaging software which enables you also to automate it, acquire your images, but also to analyze the data with a dedicated hyperspectral imaging platform that's called Image Lab. Now we are reaching the part for the application. Let us quickly go to this chat room again and see how you decide. So hello everybody. Uh, this is Enrico here. Uh, as Milan said, I'm an application engineer here at Melo since 2.5 years, and I will I would like to introduce you some applications. I prepared for you five or six, but I see that so number four is NDT. So we we have mostly spectroscopy biosensing in NDT. I would say. And then maybe if we have time, we can see a, li a little word about metal materials, I would say. So uh, I will go away from here. So spectroscopy, uh, that's, let's say, what I would define the classical application of terahertz time domain spectroscopy. And actually, this slide was already shown. So. Uh, the measurement of the electric field of the terahertz, terahertz electric field that we perform here, it's a time resolved one. So that gives us access uh, to also the phase of the electric field in the 
complete domain of the frequency spectrum. So we can not only perform a Fourier transform where we see amplitude of our electric field in frequency, but also extract the phase and so get information on refractive index of samples. I call that a macroscopic spectroscopy experiment because I want to distinguish to the next slide where we talk about biosensing. Because here the experiment is a classical experiment. I have a slab and I put my slab uh, through the beam and I take two measurements, uh, like typical in spectroscopy, or people from FTIR would know that. Um, I take a reference signal that gives me the status of my instrument, and then I put my sample inside and I compare the two measurements. And I can calculate and extract material parameters. So what we see here is, for example, absorption of the lactose sugar. I will show it live um, just uh, in a few minutes and the calculation of the refractive units where in correspondence to the absorption resonance we see a high uh, variation of the refractive units. What you can see is water lines here. Um, for people looking for even more pre precise spectroscopy it's possible to get rid of them then uh, the effort in experiments will be a little bit tough because then you need to purge your environment with nitrogen and dry air and about tough conditions Biomolecules is something uh, providing you a challenge in experimentally speaking, because usually they are suspend, they are inside some water solution and the quantities of biomolecules that you want to sample are very low. That's why some researchers of France using a Terra Smart from Mellow System, uh, they developed a uh, uh, butterfly uh, enhanced uh, field enhancement structure. So it's like a metallic antenna which allows the field enhancement in very low uh, region, so very low volume. And that allowed them to reproduce this spectrum that we see here, uh, that was measured with a macroscopic tablet of uh, uh, lactose with a very small quantity of powder or liquid. So if they first make a, a dry experiment in which they put here in the gap 200 micrograms of lactose and this corresponds now to uh, the uh, black spectrum so they were able to reproduce let's say the first two even three resonances of lactose and then they tried it out with the solution the volume of solution was only 10 microliters and they were still able to reproduce a couple of peaks which shows that the techniques uh, opens the way to sense in very small volumes and very, in very complicated situations, experimentally speaking, where a macroscopic approach like this will give you no chance. And I will move now to the next uh, application. So uh, there were many people asking for NDT and we did in the past a lot at Menlo uh, uh, with some research partners about NDT. So of course, uh, uh, I will start from a very classical example. As we see that terrets, uh, we know that terrets, um, um, water presents a very strong absorption in, terrets re in the terrets region. So uh, a classical in the literature is studying uh, the uh, humidity in a, in a plant uh, as evolution of, ta uh, of time. The technique is non-destructive because we don't need, for example, to extract the water content by burning the leaf and waiting it before and after. We can just monitor the terrence transmission as a function of time. So here the, the leaf is cut, but actually that could be done in principle on a tree if we have a measurement head to use. And speaking about water, uh, studies on capillarity can be done. So this is a wood polymer compound in which we can study how water uh, uh, penetrates inside the sample by using simply terrestrial transmission. But terrestrial transmission is not only the one, uh, the, the one parameter we can analyze. For example, we can make phase images in this NDT, uh, the non-destructive testing of polymeric compounds uh, in the terrace region, a known uh, property of polymer is that we can extract uh, the density of the polymer by studying the refractive index, which means by studying the phase delay of the terrace wave. And here we can make a map of an injection mold part in which we shine terrace light on it and we can study 
how uh, the process of molding through a barrier produce regions of uh, higher and lower density. So we see we inject from the bottom here. So we have a, an area of very high density here to the barrier. And then after the barrier, there is a, an area of low density. And here again, concentration of compound. It's something that in the visible image we cannot see, but with terrace can be revealed, just studying the phase delay, for example, of the main pulse. Uh, again, on the study of density, uh, we can study press polypropylene with different area of fiber contents or uh, even a more uh, fine measurement, uh, that's a polarization, uh, polarization is all measurement. Uh, Terrets light, uh, the way we generate it with PCAs, uh, with photoconductive antennas is polarized. Uh, slightly, we can polarize it more and make repolarization result measurements. In which, in which the uh, material under examination has a B refringent. So we have uh, a polarization dep orientation dependent refractive index and that we can uh, explore with terrace transmission and reproduce a map of the orientation of the fiber uh, that's correlated one to one with the refractive index value as we can see in these images. So I have not so much time before switching to the uh, demo. So that's why I will jump to the last requested application. I think I can see the chat. It was, uh, well, spectroscopy we cover, NDT we cover, biosensing we cover. So actually I could make a word about metamaterial because we have a little bit of time. So this is again other uh, quality control application thickness. I think I will jump. Uh, just may I just take take a word on thickness. We have a reflection net for thickness measurements. So people interested can have a, a look at the website. So metamaterials. Uh, uh, the group of Cambridge University, also a customer from us, uh, is very much involved with the study of uh, metamaterials and graphene. And they recently uh, published uh, a work, it's last year, about uh, a polarization control using a graphene metamaterials. They designed a, circuit, a metamaterial circuit where a uh, couple resonator structure is designed and uh, the terahertz field excites in different polarization, different area of the structures. And by changing the voltage on the gate, they can control the conductivity of the, metam of the graphene underneath. So it's all deposited on a layer of graphene. And the conductivity change that changing uh, the coupling with the resonators. And they can uh, actually shift the value of polarization. So they can decide how much of the component of the e field in the X direction with respect to the Y direction is transmitted and this just with the gate voltage. And at the resonances of the structure, they measure the modulation uh, speed for the terrace polarization of five megahertz. That's due to the high speed of graphene. And uh, they could rotate almost 20 degree depolarization by obtaining always a linear polarized field. So there is no elliptical polarization induced. Uh, so here details about the publication can be followed, of course. And that I would say it's all for now. And so I would like to invite you now to the Terrace System Live demo. It's running just away. I will change my headphones now. Hi, can everybody hear me? Can I get a feedback? We can hear you. Okay, perfect. So now we are on a different screen. Uh, this one is showing the system as I explained to you earlier. I'd like to do a short int introduction before Enrico takes over. I'd like to explain you what different components of such a system include. As I mentioned earlier, there's a laser source in this um, rack. It's sitting behind this fan. It needs no cooling apart from this fan that's uh, cooling down the electronics and the laser a little. We have the optical relay unit over here. So basically you have access to it. This is because you want to um, store it safely. So once you pull the system out of your lab, put it to a different place, which is possible because this one only needs the, op uh, the, the 
power supply, that's the only plug you will get from external. Um, you would need to fix the optical delay unit once such that it not moves back and forth. You don't want to have destroyed optics over here. That's the main point. Looking on the connectors here, we have uh, the BIOS voltage for the emitter. We have the signal output that's feeding into the system. Um, we have four ports over here. You might be wondered why there are two ports left open. Basically, these are the optical ports. So as, as you see from the color, it's the same port that's going to the antenna over here. We have the emitter over here. The detector is on the other side over here and all the blue cables are optical cables. So this is where the excited pulse are coming out. That's the femtosecond pulse that's creating the electron and hole pairs in the semiconductor. There are two ports left open as, as shown here. So this is the option that's referred to as dual detection or multi-channel. It's, uh, it's not laid out or from the very beginning, but you can use this port as an add-on to all our systems. Even also for Terra K15, it's not a sole feature for such a system. So basically to start such a system, I would turn on the system on the backside. I would switch on the laser source, open the graphical user interface, enable the BIOS voltage, and then we are ready to go. Short, short notice, short note on this optics here. You have seen it before. I'm not going to show you this again. Just let me quickly explain emitter and detector. Um, we have four of axis parabolic mirrors. The main point where I would put, put my sample is basically here. So basically we have to free space over here. We use this for the demo now. And I would like to hand over to Enrico in a couple of seconds again. I switch to the, I switch to my screen again, showing you the scan control software. Enrico might to tell you a few words on the software again, and also do the test measurements or live measurements with you. So hi again, everybody. I hope you can hear me. So the screen we are share, we are seeing now, it's just uh, uh, the running scan control software. Uh, it's a very, uh, uh, the interface is mainly composed by these two plots. So on the left side, we see uh, the real time plotting of the time domain pulse. And on the right side is the calculation of the Fourier transformation of it. Uh, now the measurement is running on an average mode. I am averaging 200 pulses together. It's around 20 second measurement time. I will just uh, let you have a look at what, uh, our, what we call the single shot pulse looks like. So the system works on um, a running measurement in which we do not use any lock-in amplifier. That means we just let the uh, uh, optical delay line run and we acquire on the fly with a very high speed. We are speaking high speed for the mechanical stage, a few tens of hertz. We acquire the signal and to increase our dynamic range, we just average a lot of pulses together. As opposed with a locking uh, uh, amplification method where we fix ourselves in a point uh, in the time delay and we average over that. Uh, that gives you the possibility to just see the spectrum uh, dynamically. The software has a few features. We can save the signal. We can start and stop the linear stage like I'm doing now. We can set our uh, scanning ranges and the number of averages we want to do. We can also hold the signal to have a look uh, and to have it in the background. So for example, now I hold uh, the signal right now. I will put my hand in the beam. I would see that I screen the beam, but on the background, I, I see my reference there, so to say. That we can use to have a feeling of spectroscopy, let's say, in real time, because I will hold now my background signal, so my reference, so to say, and I will put now in the beam a lactose uh, sample, and I will reproduce live for you right now the measurement of the lactose uh, absorption. So you see the main the main assortion peaks, there is a third one that is not so well seen, but once we take the property, proper uh, absorption transmission ratios and we calculate material properties, we can retrieve it. Uh, what is nice about this uh, lock, locking free approach is that we can see right away the spectrum we are working with. We can increase our dynamic range by averaging down. So for example, here, yeah, I can put uh, some averages on and that will help me to see better, for example, the resonance here. 
and uh, the, the data that I can say with the software are just time domain and Fourier transformation data. Fourier transformation will save not phase information, that's something we do later in data analysis. So our real signal is actually the time domain and that contains all the information we need for the data analysis. We have to save, of course, reference and sample as well and perform our spectroscopic analysis. Another example I would like to show you is um, just a metamaterial, very simple and cheap metamaterial actually. Uh, I cannot see it, uh, it's just there on the table. Uh, now Milan will bring me the probe. So uh, it is just an aluminum foil with some uh, periodic pattern and it's used uh, to create a sort of bandpass filter in the terrace range. There are many paper on that, it's a very classical. Exactly, now I positioned it. So it's a bandpass filter, let's say with 10 dB attenuation between the, the main band that is passing through and all the other ones. 10 dB is not extreme, but to be a very cheap uh, aluminum foil, how it is done, that's pretty good. And we can see it here, yes, it's around 10 dB and that's the band that is passing through, it's around 0.3 terahertz. It's depending on the geometry, of course. Um, and more about the uh, uh, spectrum here, so. What we are seeing, all these lines, we, uh, they are li our live sample always there. It's the humidity of air. And the absorption line of air humidity are always there unless we don't try the environment. And they are for us actually a good check that our bandwidth is really uh, as uh, high as we specify. So when we say that we, sp uh, we specify six terras, uh, we also mean that we can see spectroscopic feature up to that end and mainly water lines. So uh, it's not only a matter of noise uh, level and signal level, it's also a level of uh, reproducible time axis and that we, we can, so water can disturb, this is what I want to mean. Uh, water can disturb your experiment, but can also be helpful. In our case, it can be helpful to see if really the instrument is performing as we want. I see that there are some questions and uh, I can maybe, but we, I think we have still time. So I will just uh, tell you more about the software. So, uh, uh, the software has uh, some nice feature uh, for, for the users. One nice feature that I always like uh, because it makes uh, life simple is a fine files feature. So if we just scan somewhere else uh, because for some reason we change the optical path length of the turret uh, beam, then our position of the path is changed because it's all a timing issue. So whenever I change the position of my components here, for example, I put this antenna more far away or I put uh, uh, the second mirror, so the collimated part of the beam, I make it longer. Then my turret's light will travel more here. So my pulse from the emitter will come later to the detector. So it will be somewhere else. These are adjustments that in a scientific experiment can be done pretty often. So let's simulate a situation where I don't see my parts. So I can do, go just outside the range. So from minus 425, I scan to minus 325, for example. That should be enough not to see the parts. I will remove the old feature. I can center always all the time. So here we don't see any parts now. What can we do? We can stop the measurement and press our fine files switch. So the system will make a full scan and look where the pulse is and then center again our range in, the, in a convenient 100 picosecond window with the pulse centered in a way that we have a few picosecond of zero signal that will be useful when we do later data analysis because if we apply windows for Fourier transformation, it will allow the window here to 
put down this, uh, the noisy signal to zero and allow a proper Fourier transformation without features. And then the pulse comes and the tail of the pulse. Uh, from the same software, we can control the lasers. There is a, even a manual control. We can have a look of the condition of the laser is good enough. If the pumping current is specified, we can also turn on and off the laser by here. But actually to disable and enable, and enable the hardware, we have some buttons here. So we can switch off the antenna bias. And for a safety uh, issue for the antenna, we can first disable the bias and then disable the lasers. But the nice thing about this software, as, as I said, is that everything is here integrated even with the hardware control. And all the buttons and the features that are visible in this interface, they are controllable per remote interface. That's a topic in which I was very much involved with customers. We develop an interface where uh, we can access the instrument via a .NET uh, QWeb channel based interface. It's a very dynamic way of programming in which your scan control is a server that's sending signal to your application and you can connect your client to this signal and trigger some actions. So scan control, for example, is sending all the time a signal that tells you when a pulse was measured and it's ready to be used. You can decide to attach to this signal in your client an event handler that, for example, plots the signal or makes the Fourier transform of it or saves the signal somewhere. Um, in this way, it's a, it's a very, uh, it's approach that's very similar to writing a graphical interface application where the user makes some actions on the button and uh, your client has to trigger an action. And that's the same uh, that we thought for this interface and people are using and testing it and they are pretty happy about it. And that can be OEM customers or can be people with a very big lab and a lot of experiments running and they want to integrate them in the software of their experiment. We have support for LabVIEW, we have support for MATLAB, Python, C, uh, STAR and so on. Because they're pretty general. And let me wish you all a nice afternoon, morning or night, whenever, wherever you are tuning to. And thank you for inviting us. Thank you.